I started uh, programming when I was 15 years old. So break it down to the most basic term, like what is headless commerce? So you need to empower your teams to be able to, to respond to the consumer needs. It's actually surprising when you look at the market that there are still several very prominent uh, e-commerce platforms that completely run on monolith systems. To bring the, the changes in your, in your product that your customers will, yeah. will love, you need to be fast on your feet. Hello and welcome to another episode of the EGN Podcast. I'm your host, Etha Fontinen. Today, we're joined by Fernando Fonseca, Global Domain Lead for Digital and Consumer at CNA. Fernando and I will be talking about CNA's recent adoption of a headless commerce platform. With a wealth of experience, Fernando does an excellent job in simplifying this somewhat complex topic. Join us as we uncover the motivations, challenges, and insights gained from this transformative journey in modern retail. Let's go. Fernando, welcome to the show. Very nice to have you here, and we're thrilled to get to know you today. Thanks for having me here. It yeah, is a pleasure. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about you, who you are, um, about your journey, and then we'll get to the exciting world of uh, CNA. Oh, sure. Well, so, uh, well, I'm Fernando, I'm a Brazilian, so um, I started in tech really early, right? I, was start, I started uh, programming when I was 15 years old. Uh, I lived in um, a small town in, in, in the countryside in Brazil and got into um, a trade school, right? So to, to learn computing and all. Um, so. Since then, I got into college and then uh, continued into this journey. Got my first uh, job in 1996. It's not that I'm too uh, old, it's just that I started really early. Yeah. But uh, as a programmer, a uh, Java programmer, and, uh, and a lot of notes, so many people doesn't know about those technologies anymore. But then, uh, so right after college, I got into e-com already, working for uh, uh, a company called uh, Hotel Discount. It was the second biggest at the time uh, after Expedia, right? They didn't go so well, but it was, it was fun to write after college being in- uh, Because you messed up the code or? <laughs> I think the, the, the founder, yeah, don't, don't get me there. Okay. But <laughs> I'm not sure if he will be watching this, but uh, yeah, let's hopefully see. Hopefully not. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was fun because uh, it was uh, some crazy engineers into a room doing extreme programming and, and every design pattern uh, in the book for yeah. Java. So it was super fun. Um, but uh, after a while, I started moving, uh, moving jobs and I started to become more senior and all and, and, um, and managing other engineers. And then I became a solution architect, uh, then working uh, for big corporates in Brazil. So in oil, in logistics, uh, right? Um, and then I got into IBM 2005 as a solution architect. Uh, so, after a while, I started to lead teams there as well. So, and that uh, was a wonderful ride because 10 years in IBM, I managed to, to go from software development to security to infrastructure. And it was a wonderful university, uh, yeah. if you say so. Uh, and started to, to manage managers. Um, so a lot of fun, but then after those 10 years, uh, I left IBM, we started a small company with some cousins, right? That didn't fly, we didn't get the funding, we didn't uh, uh, manage to, to continue, but then I got- You didn't fail, you learned. Exactly, right? so always, right? So, uh, and it was super fun because after so long in corporate, being into this startup world was super energizing, yeah. right? 
And that helped me getting my next gig. Because then uh, when I moved to, to Europe, I went to work for Farfetch, which is a big marketplace for fashion goods, right? Uh, and then I, I worked in their uh, white label platform, uh, building e-com for uh, famous designers like Tom Brown and Macintosh and all. Wow. Right? So it was super fun. Uh, and also was um, good learning about the, the scale ups, right? So it was a company that was really successful uh, on their IPO and all. But then I got an offer from HelloFresh to come to Berlin. And after working on, on so many areas in, in tech, right? So uh, development infrastructure and all, there was one piece that I didn't uh, have much experience uh, with, which was big data. So then I came to, to Berlin, worked for, for HelloFresh, uh, and it was a wonderful ride because uh, I was leading first their CRM tech team, but then we evolved up to ad tech. So uh, in the end, we came from uh, me and a couple of engineers to a team of uh, more than 50 people. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, doing all sorts of uh, fancy uh, ad tech, marketing tech solutions, and also the, the experimentation platform for, for the company. So really, uh, I learned a lot. Um, and then uh, CNA uh, called me to lead their, uh, their digital and consumer domain. So basically, uh, to lead the engineering teams that support the web shop, yeah. the app, the online marketing there. So in the transformation uh, um, uh, environment, right? So uh, came to help them uh, in this journey of becoming a, a modern digital business, yeah. uh, and was also super, uh, super interesting to be able to use that background uh, in in big corporates, and also the learnings that I got from startups, scale yeah. ups. To, to apply there, and uh, I, I, I like to think that uh, my impact there is, is, uh, is, um, is big and helping to transform the, the company right yeah. now. HelloFresh was also part of our conference um, just a couple months ago, and um, so seeing your journey uh, makes me think like this wealth of experience, uh, I don't know how many years in total, and uh, maybe you are nine years old, but just looking very, very young. Uh, well, but um, yeah, that, that I'm, I feel privileged to sit next to you and learn from you today. Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about um, CNA and how um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about your day to day work and what you've been busy doing there. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I came uh, to to CNA to help the uh, transform. So. Then these, uh, the digital and consumer domain, so everything consumer facing on our e-com yeah. was the spearheaded on that transformation, right? So we're coming from a very traditional structured teams with functions separate and under uh, a centralized business uh, uh, organization to uh, a more dynamic and, um, and distributed setup with product teams yeah across the, the user journey. Uh, so in these one and a half years that I'm with them, we managed to, to uh, transform quite uh, heavily in that domain. And now this domain is also serving as a blueprint for the others, yeah. right? So, uh, and with my, uh, my uh, product counterpart and the head of uh, user experience, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to, to, be, uh, to have been able to, to uh, kickstart this transformation so, so heavily, yeah. Yeah, today we, um, I mean, just to tell you a little bit about the background of this podcast, we have had um, almost all the prominent platforms, uh, TikTok, uh, Meta, and all the others, um, Liferando, and so we, we are kind of discovering different parts of e-commerce. CNA has a very strong footprint, uh, especially in e-commerce, of being very close to um, one of the big uh, consumer brands in Germany, German e-commerce also. And to put things into perspective, 
how big are the teams that you're talking about? Like how, um, how many employees uh, do you have in Germany? If you can say a few words on this. Sure. Uh, so in, in tech in general is around 500 people. Yeah. Plus the business teams uh, and, and, and product teams. In digital, that is the most mixed bunch. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, 120 people, right? So product, design, and tech. Yeah. Uh, so it's not such a big operation, but it's already in a good size yeah. to, to make some impact. And I think that um, uh, for the size that, that Aricom is right now, it's, it's quite okay. Um, but yeah, the, the brand is is uh, is wonderful. It's more than one hundred years old. Yeah. It's also funny how I came to to CNA because uh, in the beginning, or at least here in, in in the Berlin area, they are not so very well known as a as a company uh, that has technology and everything. But then when the recruiter called me. Uh, uh, it came to my mind the CNA brand that I that I had from Brazil, yeah, and they're quite big over there. Uh, so they still are. They're still they are the second biggest retailer uh, in the in the country. And for you to to have an idea of how how big they are, in the eighties they had a big marketing campaign there. And there's an actor that was in, in, in uh, the face of that campaign. And the guy's so famous that he still is invited to podcasts and everything to this day. Yeah. So it's super funny how, how this is. But uh, yeah, when they called me, I thought, well, yeah, it's a, it's a big brand. And uh, yeah, it would, it would be nice to, to, to take this challenge. How many markets are they in? Uh, in Europe, 18, right? Yeah. So this is our organization. Uh, for example, CNA in Brazil already IPO'd. Yeah. So the, the founders, they still have a big stake there uh, in, in Canada and Asia as well. Yeah. But uh, right now, the, the CNA organization is around those 18 countries in Europe. Yeah, wow, it's, it's massive still. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, let's, let's maybe take a little bit deeper dive on what you've been busy doing with um, headless commerce. We, we've talked about it in our previous conversation before the podcast episode. Um, right now, maybe you could tell us about like the general challenge that not only CNA, but like many other e-com brands might be going through, um, switching to a, a new set of technology stacks or a new platform so that they can cater to their business and to their customers in a much better way. Absolutely. Uh, so in the, in the last few years, the, the industry around marketing and e-com and all, it grew a lot, right? So many different companies have very interesting solutions. And then um, the, that poses a question to, to companies that want to leverage their, their e-com. Yeah. How to do it? How to use all this potential, right, uh, in, in their favor? And then it comes this, um, this talk about headless e-com, composable e-commerce, and all that. Um, so when I joined CNA, that, trans that, um, that project, that program had kick-started already. I was um, sort of in the middle of the process, right? But, um, but the idea was to come from a, um, a centralized solution provided by IBM that they had to, like from 10 years ago or so, uh, and uh, into uh, a more distributed and best of breed approach so we can serve our customers better, right? So with better time to market and more um, customer-centric tailored solutions, right? That was the whole strategy behind it. Yeah. Or better this, performance, perhaps. Of course, right. So also better performance um, and uh, in in more flexibility. Yeah. Because also to bring the the changes in your in your product that your customers will, yeah. will love, you need to be fast on your feet. So break it down to the most basic term. Like, what is headless commerce? 
Sure. So, uh, handless commerce is uh, is an approach on decomposing your solution into into uh, um, different solutions across your customer journey. Yeah. So you would have the uh, best solution for your acquisition, the best solution for your retention, best solution for order management, best solution for for conversions, for payments, so on and so forth, yeah. right? Returns and all. This is the, the main idea behind it. Uh, of course, uh, you still need a glue in between, right? So it's not just um, uh, assembling some Lego. APIs. Exactly. So of course, you need to be API based. You need to have some flexibility, a synchronous synchronous. Uh, so some, some technical uh, requirements yeah. around it. Um, and for this to work well, it needs to, to be um, coordinated and orchestrated by... Documented also. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> by product teams that have the, the customer value as, as their, their North Star, right? So how we, we, we make our life of our consumers easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so um, we've talked about headless. So CNA, when you started there, they had this monolithic uh, structure and they're, they're moving. Um, can you describe also for our viewers and listeners what the biggest disadvantage of this monolithic structure is? Sure. Uh, so first of all, you tend to, to um, mimic a, a very centralized organization as well. Yeah. Because the, the systems will follow the the same uh, communication channels and patterns that you have in, on your organization. Yeah. So that also means that that your your team when they gonna scale up because you need more people, yeah. you need to go decentralize on your systems as well. Otherwise, it becomes yeah. a bottleneck, right? Um, so this is one. So how to organize and scale up yeah. your team? Uh, but the most important um, is how you leverage the, the time to market in the different areas, yeah. right? Because if you are more focused on one problem that you need to solve and you don't need to take care too much of what's going on around you because you are protected by a, an API, yeah. it's a lot easier for you to, to ship the value to your consumers that yeah. way. Right, so it's mostly to achieve that uh, that speed to market. Um, by no means being an expert in this, but in my observation, I, I've as a CMO of ePages, I've also had the experience um, building and g bringing to market a whole API first based uh, headless commerce platform. Um, I think one thing that we always thought about was to really have a platform where you, as you said, smaller teams can work on a certain microservice, um, be it return handling, uh, so payment processing, whatever it is, without really breaking down, or maybe if there's a bug, it won't necessarily affect the larger system. So I think for me, it was like a, this agility part was quite a, a factor for us in the development and seeing how our agile teams also could work with this. Um, I guess for you, it's a much bigger company, much bigger pro uh, teams. Um, I, I guess this made a lot of things easier, but you all, either, either you keep both platforms, you keep working on a new platform, but you still have to maintain the older one. Yes. Right? So how do you deal with that? This can become very technical, but I'll try to break it down. Right? So in this, uh, there are some strategies on how you go about slicing and dicing your your monolith yeah right so one thing that uh i and i can't take any credit for it it was uh um, the people that were already there in cnn and take they took a very clever uh and well done first step which was wrapping this um this monolith into a cloud infra infrastructure so they took it from from uh, from in premises, put it on the on the cloud, put a wrap around it with APIs and all, and that it started to become easier to slice one part, plug in the other. Okay. 
So um, this is very important and you're going to need very specialized technical people to be able to do that yeah. the proper way. Right. Uh, so the approach wasn't to build an entirely new platform from scratch no. rather than bits piece by piece. Yeah. So we need to change the, the wheels with the buzz running. Right. So uh, it's, it's I think that for most companies, that's going to be the case. So it's still gonna be using your monolith, and our monoliths are still there. We're gonna finish uh, carving it out this year, right? It's, it's sleeping. It's sleeping. There's a a, a, a poor uh, piece of it, but uh, yeah, we want to to carve it out this year. Hopefully, it's it's also very challenging, but uh, we're pushing for it. So at the end of this year, you'd be done with the monolith. Um, no longer have to maintain this. That's right. That's right. Because it's yeah, yeah, it's huge. But it's still, it can, uh, it could be some challenges. For example, when we are launching new countries with different um, currencies and all. Uh, so after we we carve it out, then we're gonna be much much more uh, flexible uh, on our country launches and everything else. So you mentioned that these 18 markets in Europe will be run by one platform, probably. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. And, and we can plug in others and change much easier than before. Yeah. Okay. So um, does it also have a significant... Like, let's, let's put ourselves in the shoes of... Okay, we, up until now, we've been looking at it from the perspective of CNA employees or the engineering teams. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of the con end consumer, just buying something on your website. What will be different? Uh, so for once, the, the performance of your uh, order uh, processing, right? So how you're going to be able to um, process your return faster, uh, how we're going to be able to plug in a, a delivery center closer to your home yeah. more easily. Right, and provide you a better experience. Plus, there's that goes all across the 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 journey, and there are changes that we already done. For example, uh, we um, we can segment and and give uh, much better suggestions or uh, recommendations to our consumers now. Uh, we can engage different um, uh, profiles in a different way as well that are more meaningful to them. Yeah. So this is something that we already done, uh, and uh, yeah, and we can see that uh, the the experience of the customer really improved. Yeah, and when you look at, let's say, you're you're launching new markets. Um, you can just basically add that as a module and um, just localize it with a certain locale and uh, just go from there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's a simplification, but it's like this because previously it took us months and months. Yeah. Right. So now it should take, I don't know, a few weeks to be able to do that. All that being said makes me also think like this is based on the assumption that this headless commerce approach or API first approach is future proof. What if in five years there's a whole uh, different set of expectations from the market? Uh, how can you guarantee that or is that even um, a thought process? Yeah, so this is a very interesting point because it can be a big pitfall for companies, yeah. right? Um, so as I said before, it's not just like assembling Lego. Yeah. So I think that the way to be really uh, future-proof is that you put uh, product teams around it, ar around each part of the customer journey, because they are going to be able to uh, assess uh, the, the the customer value and, and how the customers are responding to that solution, and they make the adjustments on the fly and even adjust the the strategy, because maybe one of our, uh, of the solutions that we have. On our portfolio is not not fulfilling the customer needs anymore. Yeah, but since they are there looking at the data every day, they are the ones in the best position to make that decision. Yeah, right. So you need to empower your teams 
to be able to to respond to the consumer needs. Yeah. So it's a lot about how you organize your company rather than the technology that you you implement. Yeah. I think it's also worthwhile to mention the monolithic structures are also very hard to maintain these days because the Perl developers are um, like most new developers that come onto the market, they are interested in developing with a new set of uh, tech stacks that, um, you know, it, it's becoming also difficult to find the employees that manage and uh, maintain the platform. That's right. Um, well, so there's, there are still some companies that they can operate with the monolith and still be fast yeah. to market, right? Um, as I said, it's more like you organize your teams and, and being a technologist, I need to be a, a bit careful on how we approach the solutions, right? Because um, some of those, um, uh, those, those words can, can become really trendy and sometimes they, they lose their meaning. So on, on, when it comes to moving to microservices, companies need to understand that they are increasing the complexity to achieve more time to market. Yeah. It's a trade-off. So for the size of your company and for how you are organized, you need to fine tune it. Yeah. How, how distributed did I get for the size of the company and, and uh, the necessities of, of the consumers? Yeah. And because for small companies, you can still start with a monolith, I would say. Right? But as you scale up, you're probably going to need to start breaking down your your tech real estate. Fernando, you've been also working with uh, several tech companies, IBM, uh, HelloFresh, um, to name a few. Um, I want to ask you, how do you, see, because I come from also e-commerce platforms, you know, it just, it's actually surprising when you look at the market that there are still several very prominent uh, e-commerce platforms that completely run on monolith systems. Um, how, how do you see that for brands? Um, to what extent has this been implemented by the biggest brands? So can you name a few examples um, from your experience or your yeah, observation? Sure. For example, uh, one that successfully implemented this, for yeah. example. So for example, uh, Shopify is a big brand, a big company that still has a big monolith. Yeah. Of course, there's a good deal of their systems that are distributed, but the core is still a monolith. Yeah. But they have a wonderful uh, tech platform team that can make that happen, as yeah. I said, uh, wrapping this up in a, in a cloud uh, environment. Um, but many other companies, so HelloFresh also had a monolith, right? So we were also covering it, it out. I believe that most of it might be gone already, um, but that's actually the, let's say, the, the, the standard in the market that most companies started with a monolith because they want to start fast and, and uh, bring value to their consumers yeah. really fast. So they go, to the, go through the monolith approach. And then as they scale up, the, for, so the teams can be more independent and autonomous, they yeah. start to break down their systems, yeah. right? But most of them, uh, also Liferando had a monolith in the beginning. They, they came from the same uh, company, the same uh, investor, Rocket, that provided yeah. them with systems and all as well. So, yeah, yeah. most companies uh, go through that journey. Liferando, the managing director, was part of this podcast, um, but we didn't really talk about the platform side of things so much. We talked about the end user experience. But, um, yeah, when... when if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Netflix is completely running on this uh, headless platform as yes. well. Yes, um, Netflix, also Spotify. Yeah, they already started, or most of their 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 systems already in into this microservices approach yeah. and all. Yes, but they are quite big, and for example, the the complexity around uh, around Netflix management and all. Uh, is so massive that they create their own uh, tools that then uh, other companies start to use uh, to manage those microservices and all. Okay. So uh, I, I would advise companies that are not that big into tech to go into that route. Yeah. As I said, they need to assess 
where they are in their journey and try to come up with uh, the level of granularity uh, to the systems uh, that would make sense for, for uh, where they are at at the moment. It's interesting you say that because we do have an audience that um, it's a one-man show sometimes, it's small business, all the way up to enterprise um, platforms that uh, serve millions of people. In the case of Liferendover, for example, they have 15 million end users that they're serving. And it's just an example. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's hard to make a blanket statement, hey, this is one size, one size fits mm -hmm. for all, right? Definitely. It's, uh, there's no way to come up with a recipe or anything like this. It's really about uh, the, the strategy that a company has, also acknowledging their limitations, yeah. Right, and, and finding the, the best solution for them at the moment. Yeah. Right, but of course, flexibility can help any company, right? So you need to, 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 to strive for that and fine tune for the limitations you have. Can you break it down maybe for like, let's say for a smaller business operating in e-commerce, um, what is in your opinion or experience the best way to get started, let's say, up until uh, 100 employees, like 50 employees, 100 employees, what's mm. the best approach That's a to good take? Uh, and I hope I don't, I don't uh, give too much um, uh, or <laughs> I don't encourage people to, to take too much risks, but I think for such companies, the, the biggest risk is not having a clear idea of what the consumers want. Right? They need to validate that as fast as they can. Yeah. So I would try to go for an MVP if you're just selling for retailers, right? I would just try to go with an MVP maybe using Shopify platform or other Jingdu platform or other platforms like this that can give you a, a e-com fast. Without reinventing the wheel. Without reinventing the wheel, yeah. right? Some customizations put on your twist in, into that, put it in your hand of consumers, see how they respond, Yeah, right? That will give you a lot of insights, understand what's the next step. And if your idea is sound, and after you prove that doing, doing like this, then you invest more on your, uh, on your uh, teams to really build something uh, internally that, that's meaningful for your consumers. Yeah. But test the idea, I think that's the most important thing that they need to do in, yeah. in the beginning. Especially for the smaller guys that might not have big budgets on this. Just test, fail if you have to, and then Absolutely. test something else. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think for me, the, the biggest benefit of this um, headless commerce approach is um, just you, you've talked about it, decoupling the front end from the back end. So on the front end side, whatever innovations and uh, improvements might come in the market, that at, at least the general idea is that you, well, you are well fitted, uh, well suited to adapt to this. Like because you you would have the uh, back end processes that can just connect to whatever it is. Maybe in the future we will be shopping. Like one of the trends right now is immersive commerce, um, whereby you're not only the known examples such as Apple Vision Pro or Meta Quest 3, but also Ray-Ban, for example, they, they have a very, very interesting um, concept. It's much, much simpler. Like you, you could be wearing one of those. There's usually a little dot, so you recognize mm -hmm. the camera, but you can identify it as a, as a complete separate um, thing, like a computer. What I mean to see, there, there's Snapchat, for example, they have their own uh, eyeglasses. And one, one use case is super interesting, how we will interact with e-commerce brands. Um, let's say we're sitting in the metro and you're, you're in front of me. I like your socks. You know, I can just, with pattern recognition, I can even identify the socks and the brand that is selling something similar um, and then just buy. It, it can make my journey a lot easier. And mm -hmm. I think there's like a, I want to establish the link by having such a uh, well-known, uh, well-informed um, expert like you, yourself. And um, all these things that we talked about in marketing, like the trends that are coming, um, would you say headless commerce is helping us ta tap into these types of trends better? Definitely, definitely. 
because it gives you the flexibility of the, uh, decoupling your APIs. So in a way it's plug and play as well, right? Yeah. So if you need to, to plug in a new solution, if you have your, your composable uh, architecture uh, already done, yeah. it's a lot easier to, to incorporate this for sure. Um, I don't, as a moderator, I don't always like to focus on ev everything that went lovey-dovey and perfectly fine. Um, I also want to ask you, what are some epic fails that you've seen? I mean, like you, you, some mistakes where you invested time, energy, efforts and money with several teams. Um, I think it's also meaningful to talk about those. And sure. could you name us uh, maybe three examples or things that you've seen didn't work out well um, by yeah, sure, absolutely. developing a new platform. I won't be able to tell you what were the, the <laughs> providers or right where, now because okay, but I can give you. Um, um, so f one of them is um, having a, s a super sophisticated setup for the task that is not that so sophisticated. We've seen that also in CNA, right? Uh, and we're trying to adjust also to bring this to the the cost that makes sense for the operation we have, right? So uh, maybe shutting down part of those uh, of those providers, looking for others. I think that's that's something that people need to to be really aware of, right? How you get uh, value out of the solutions that you're buying. Yeah. This is something that uh, we failed and we, we're learning about this. Another very important one is about customizations, right? So if you buy a solution that requires a lot of customizations, that's a big problem. You end up with a bigger uh, bottleneck that, than you had before, yeah. right? So we have one of those in our portfolio and we're gonna need to suffer again to, to carve that out and move to a different solution. So yeah. again, um, I think that the message is avoid any customization uh, or try to, to have that at the minimum, right? Is, is, uh, I think that would be a good advice for everyone. Yeah, sounds great. And um, I'm hoping that these insights from you will also be thought provoking and if, um, someone has further questions, um, they can always reach out to you on LinkedIn, I, I believe. For sure, absolutely. And um, yeah, so it's been a pleasure uh, to get to know you, Fernando, and also how you've gotten accustomed to the CNA brand all the way in Brazil, <laughs> and just your, your personal journey that even brought you to Germany and um, having worked in several companies. Um, it, I, I feel privileged to have had this conversation with you. Um, thank you so much for being here. No, the pleasure is all mine. Um, as I was saying uh, to you before, I think that uh, in in few years I didn't do that much. So, and after ETA, I, th I thought that I should do that more, right? Because it felt good. Yeah. And it, it, uh, I, I love to have that kind of conversation. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for having uh, me here. All right. See you next time. See you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the e-commerce Germany news podcast. If you did, make sure to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment and follow us on our channels. Feel free to also recommend this podcast to your contacts and friends that may want to know more about e-commerce, digital marketing and success stories. Thank you very much for listening and watching and see you on the next episode.